Hi, I'm excited to share some recent work performed at University of Florida with James Fairbanks and Tyler Hanks in collaboration with Evan Patterson at the Topos Institute. Together, we've released this package, Algebraic Rewriting, which implements a technique called graph transformation. It's also called graph rewriting. Uh, this is part of a software ecosystem called Algebraic Julia. So at a high level, the library allows you to declare and execute rewriting systems. And the important questions that I want to answer here are, what problems can be solved with rewriting systems? How do you actually use this software? And then what are some of the unique advantages of this approach? So in short, the technique is a declarative language for transforming data in a very controlled way. And uh, it has a very intuitive interface for how you define the rewrite rules. And it has advantages of transparency, generality, and transferability, which I'll go into more detail at the end of the talk. So, why don't we get started with uh, some more detail about the types of problems that we can apply this to. So in general, we have some possibly complex data structure that we want to modify. Uh, and of course, you could always write uh, imperative code to do such a thing. But if we want to be declarative, maybe you'd reach for something like SQL. So you could imagine an SQL query, which identifies a region of your data that you want to modify, and then performs an update. And that would work, but SQL is really a big hammer to use for this problem. It can do a lot of things, whereas uh, we're going to try to describe a language which is really tailored to this very specific type of uh, modification. And the three examples that I'm going to highlight in this section are performing a simulation, uh, generating structures via a grammar, and performing equational reasoning. So our first example is uh, performing a simulation by defining a rewriting system that has a set of rewrite rules. And you could imagine encoding your knowledge of chemistry into a set of reactions like this. And once you've defined a data structure for your molecules, algebraic rewriting would then let you define these rewrite rules just like you see here. You give a left-hand pattern uh, and a right-hand replacement, and that defines a rewrite rule. Uh, once we've defined our knowledge in the form of rewrite rules, we can then start simulating. So we can start with some initial molecule uh, or set of initial molecules and then apply the rewrite rules. Now, there are many possible rewrite rules you could apply at a given time. So you need some sort of methodology for scheduling those rewrites. Uh, but in general, with that decided, uh, you can then start performing very complex simulations, uh, even though the input into that simulation was the, these three, in this case, you know, three rewrite rules, which are very declarative structures. Uh, the next application is generating structures via a grammar. So it's going to be the same mechanism of uh, the same methodology, except now we have a different use case, which is that we want to explore uh, a space of instances of some data structure. Uh, one potential application of that is scientific model exploration. So if my scientific model has a neat description in terms of some data structure, let's say uh, I'm interested in chemical reaction networks because I have this concentration data that's changing over time, and I want to find the network that explains that. Uh, so really, I want to generate networks as hypotheses to test against that data. But I don't want to just generate completely randomly. And rewrite rules uh, are essentially a tool that could let you uh, more intelligently explore the space of possible reaction networks in a way that uh, I can use my domain knowledge to explore that uh, in, a, in a more efficient way. Uh, alternatively, you could have some complex system that you're going to represent at a high level, such as a robot or a big piece of software, and you have a high level uh, representation uh, of what's going on in terms of certain states that you can be in, the flow of information, the transition from one state to the next. Uh, and you can also have certain states that should be impossible or are undesirable. Uh, and what you can do is by performing rewriting, which is sort of simulating, in another sense, a, a, a transition, then you can make sure that your design is not entering states that you don't want. And so you can actually catch conceptual bugs before you've even written any code. And this is a paradigm of model-driven development. Also kind of verification is uh, you've written code which processes a kind of richly structured data structure, and you want to generate instances of that 
Uh, and it's a much more robust technique than just writing a single unit test with a particular input, uh, but rather you want to explore the space of possible inputs so that you can be really sure that you've implemented it correct. Uh, I think it's also interesting that you can generate Feynman diagrams from some uh, very uh, initial materials and then applying these simple production rules to progressively generate them all. So the last example I want to highlight is equational reasoning. So this uh, is going to use directed wiring diagrams, which is a particular data structure that we use in Algebraic Julia. Uh, and we're going to represent uh, symbolic expression trees with these directed wiring diagrams. So let me briefly say how to interpret these. Uh, we're going to have input wires, and those outer input wires are essentially free variables, because anything could flow along those. So let's just call that a variable x. And these boxes represent operations, and you could just think of those as functions which take in certain inputs and produce an output. And really these junctions here are representing particular values. So any two junctions that are connected by a wire are really talking about the same uh, value living on that wire. So with that said, we want to prove that uh, 1 times x times x times 1 is equal to x times x. Uh, and so our rewrite rule is going to have the semantics of if I see the, if I see the source, uh, I can replace it with the target. Uh, so if I see this uh, something being multiplied by 1, uh, I can replace that with a, a wire that just goes straight through, because that's an identity. Uh, now this notion of replacing is kind of destructive, and there's actually a, a pretty clever thing we can do, which is to not ever destroy information, but rather... Uh, always add information. So if I were to add the information that this is equivalent to a straight wire, what that would be uh, effectively doing is connecting this x and this x plus x, x times 1. So what happens if we apply this rewrite rule to our original instance? What it would do is it would essentially merge the output of this multiplication with its input. And if we were to apply a right identity rule, uh, we would get the structure at the bottom. And what's interesting is that now we can extract the term x times x from this and really get, in some sense, an optimized program, which, we've, which provably uh, computes the same thing. Uh, and this process of uh, applying these equalities and building up information is something that's called equality saturation in the language of e-graphs. So hopefully that showed that these kinds of methods can be applied in diverse settings. And now I want to talk more about a particular example to show what it's like to code up a particular rewriting system. And I'll walk through the process of using algebraic rewriting to perform a chemistry simulation. Now there's three major steps here, and we're going to start with defining the data structure that we're going to perform rewrites on. That means I need to introduce C sets, which are an important kind of data type that we widely use in algebraic Julia. We're not limited to rewriting on C sets, but as we'll see, they're very general and suffice for most practical applications. And that's because they're at least as expressive as relational databases. So a C set isn't a specific data type, but rather once you provide a C, which is a parameter, uh, you get a data type. And this C plays the role of a schema in a relational database. So that C comes from the word category because many things that we do with this data structure are informed by the math of category theory. But don't worry, you don't need to know any category theory to fluently use these data structures. So I'm going to show some examples of C sets and how they're defined. So we'll start with multi-directed uh, graphs. So that means we have a set of edges and we have a set of vertices. And we have a source and a target function. So what I was highlighting here was the schema C. And so if I wanted to represent this particular graph, I would say, OK, there are three edges and there are three vertices. And I need to say for each edge what its source is and for every edge what its target is. Uh, we also can do bipartite multigraphs. So this is going to have an edge set, uh, two different edge sets and two different vertex sets, which we could call uh, states and transitions. Uh, and we could call the edges inputs and outputs and represent them like this. And this is something that can represent petri nets, uh, which represent uh, chemical reaction networks or epidemiological models. 
uh, and now you can see how this is characterized as a database as well in addition to a nice visual representation. So this example shows, uh, which represents a 2D mesh with triangles, shows how uh, we can add triangles to a graph and now we can actually have equations which uh, enforce that these triangles are actually triangles rather than just randomly chosen edges. Uh, for this smaller instance, you can see we have two triangles which share a face, and it's good to be able to think of this in terms of the database representation. This is very easy to manipulate, uh, and you have two triangles here, and each of those refers to three different edges, each of which refers to two vertices. So now let's return to our chemistry problem. So the trickiest issue here is uh, representing chemical bonds as undirected. And one way to do that is to make the bond table actually have two rows for every single chemical bond. In one row, we'll point to a source. In one row, we'll point to a target. Uh, but there's no order between those two. And so the way that we pair up the, the bonds, which are actually corresponding to the same bond, is to give this function, this involution function, which we enforce with this equation. So the code is shown here on the left, which is how you would declare this data structure in CatLab and then create the data type. So let's think about uh, how we would represent a water molecule and a carbon-fluorine uh, bond. Uh, this might be a good pattern for a reaction because this water molecule might want to uh, replace the, the fluorine with a hydrogen. So to make this the pattern of a rewrite rule, all we need to do is create this database instance, which effectively encodes this uh, pattern that we see here. So it's it's very easy to create these things, and now, now that we know how to create instances of the chemical species C set, we can now talk more about uh, how do we design rewrite rules to do what we want. So I need to briefly detour to explain the mathematical theory of graph rewriting. Uh, this requires us to have a notion of a partial mapping from one thing to another. So uh, a partial function, in this case, is something that isn't defined on all inputs, and then it's just a function defined on the, the rest of things. And it's interesting that you can represent this as a pair of functions, where we have an interface set, and that picks out really the subset that is defined, and then we just have a regular function on that. So uh, note that we require the leftward facing arrow to be uh, injective so that the overall function is well defined. So uh, with that said, now we can say, a rewrite rule is uh, merely a partial map between your data structure of interest that you're trying to rewrite. So we have this top row here, and this is essentially the rewrite rule. Uh, the L here is the pattern that we want to match. The R is the thing that we want to replace that pattern with. Uh, and this I, we needed to define it in order to have a partial map, but uh, we could think semantically what does it actually mean. And what it refers to then is the sub-object of our pattern that does not get deleted. It ends up somewhere in the replacement. So it is not deleted, but everything that's an L that is not an I does get deleted. So that is uh, 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 these two maps are the data that you need, and you need these three structures. So let's look at what does this rewrite rule do. So this is for the C set of meshes. Uh, with triangles. So we're going to match a pair of triangles that shares a, a face. We will then delete those triangles and then we will add two more triangles but they're facing the opposite direction. We've sort of flipped the direction of that edge. And now how do we apply this rewrite rule? Uh, what we need to apply it is really the data of well what is this matching to in our uh, graph of interest. So here we're matching to this left hand pair of triangles. Uh, if we perform this thing called a push-out complement, uh, then we perform the deletion, and then when we perform this uh, push-out, we get the result of the rewrite. So uh, you can see that our library exposes this high-level interface where you basically give the pair of maps and constructor uh, a rule constructor. And then you can either call rewrite with that rule directly on some thing that you want to rewrite, or you could actually provide a specific match. Otherwise, it will just find uh, the first one that it sees. So uh, before moving on to the scheduling of some set of rewrites as a rewrite system, uh, 
I want to draw attention to some alternatives to double pushout rewriting. So DPO is usually sufficient, but there are sometimes we want alternative semantics which handle uh, certain edge cases. So in this case, I'm explicitly deleting this blue vertex, uh, but that blue vertex is connected to this magenta or lavender triangle. Uh, what are we supposed to do? Is that triangle supposed to just have a dangling edge and not actually refer to, uh, uh, doesn't have a vertex? So we, we can't have that. So DPO would say this is not a valid rewrite. Uh, single pushout rewriting has the semantics of you're going to cascade delete whenever you delete something. Uh, sesqui pushout rewriting essentially allows you to copy things uh, without explicitly saying so. So if I my rule here is saying I'm going to take this vertex and I'm going to duplicate it. Uh, if we look at this particular black vertex and we're to make a copy and drag it to the other side, uh, sesqui pushout rewriting is going to create another triangle and two extra edges. Uh, and that is sometimes uh, what you want to do. Uh, it's not the case that you always, for a single simulation, you want all rules to have the same semantics. So it's really on a per rule basis that you can declare what the semantics of the rewrite rule is. Uh, and I want to say that there's some more extensions that we can make to get uh, even more expressivity out of these rewrite systems. So for example, uh, the meaning of attributes uh, in terms of C sets is that they must match exactly. So this means that a carbon atom can only map to a carbon atom. And that is very often what we want out of attributes. Uh, but there are times that we actually want variables. So this case would be a rewrite rule that says uh, this uh, fluorine molecule is going to break this bond and replace uh, whatever this thing is. I don't care what it is. So being able to uh, represent variables is also uh, a really important feature to have. And uh, furthermore, negative application conditions is extra data that you can give to your rewrite rule. So this is the L of a rewrite rule. If we also specify this end pattern, which is supposed to say, this is forbidden context. If you have this context, actually don't do the rewrite rule. And that is uh, formalized by saying, for a given match, uh, if there exists a triangle like this that the functions actually commute, then uh, you're not allowed to perform the rewrite. And this is actually very motivated because uh, often chemists don't want a particular uh, part of their molecule to react with something like uh, a reactive molecule. So they'll add this very bulky thing called a tert butyl group, and it's going to protect this uh, thing from reacting with the fluorine. So uh, essentially, by encoding this in the rewrite rule, saying if you see a tert butyl group adjacent to this uh, functional group that could react, then actually don't react. So you can get some pretty complicated logic encoded into your rewrite rules, but still having a declarative interface of just having you know, these structures and maps between them as your language for specifying a rewrite system. So I'll talk briefly about scheduling, which is that uh, right now we support executing rules in a particular order, uh, in a random order, uh, with executing them until there are no further changes. Uh, and you can also do this hierarchically. Uh, this is something that we exploited to do a uh, epidemiological simulation where we have different age groups interacting at different frequencies and that produced and those interaction uh, constants were jet were chosen to get real uh, from real data and we could see things like oh the elderly don't interact with working age people as much so they're not going to have as high of a total infection rate uh, so this is uh, the value of doing more realistic simulations by controlling how frequently these rules get executed. So I lastly want to talk about advantages that this approach has, and uh, that begins with saying what the alternatives are. Uh, to my understanding, you could do this without using a declarative interface at all, uh, but then, uh, yeah, you have a lot of issues of interpretability, transparency that uh, it's, it's not clear when something goes wrong why it went wrong. Uh, there are domain-specific simulation softwares that may not, might not be super general, uh, but they're really fit for purpose for a particular uh, data structure that you're interested in. There's also agent-based modeling, which is more uh, object-oriented style, where you define your agents, which interact with it, have sort of code functions associated with them, which modify an environment, and then you sort of let all those agents go loose in a simulation. So 
I'll say that uh, our approach has a certain level of generality because this DPO really works uh, for any kind of data structure as long as it has a notion of pattern match, uh, push out and push out complement, which are essentially related to the idea of how do you glue things together. Uh, there's also this transparency which comes from having your algorithm as data rather than code. Because let's say I notice something's going wrong, that I'm violating the octet rule, uh, something has too many bonds. Uh, I can actually, in a very automated way, analyze my uh, rewrite rules and see, oh, which one actually introduces too many bonds. Uh, this is a very different methodology from actually looking for bugs in code. Uh, Furthermore, we get extra interpretability about our results because uh, this, this system actually induces a map from our state, let's say state at time n, to our state at time n plus 1. We actually have a way of relating those two states in a, in a record of the provenance of our rewritten result. Uh, I'll lastly talk about transferability where uh, we can make modifications to our schema and actually migrate uh, our data, including our rewrite rules, from old schemas into new schemas. So this is a feature that CatLab offers. Uh, so we might want to embed our schema into something that also has phonons. Let's say we're trying to model uh, a simulation that actually has temperature, and a reaction can't happen unless there's also a required amount of energy. Uh, we might uh, also have an alternate representation of symmetric bonds, and we want to be able to translate between these two. And we might also want to encode our uh, molecules into some two-dimensional grid and actually do a simulation where we're actually modeling space. So for future work, we're uh, really still in uh, our infancy for this library. There's lots of things that we want to do. Uh, there's a lot more advanced scheduling we can do. Uh, I think something that's really useful is when you have a rewrite that you expected to happen, that you have some user-friendly way of seeing why a match was rejected. Maybe it was the negative application condition. Maybe uh, the DPO dangling condition failed and you were trying to delete something that was connected to something else. There's, there's lots of reasons why a rewrite might not happen. Uh, there's a lot of ways to improve the performance of our system that we're working on. Uh, and also, uh, one example of that might be executing rewrites in parallel. Uh, but in general, we're really excited for the potential of this library to be used in a really diverse uh, contexts. So with that, I want to thank uh, collaborators at Topos, Florida, Georgia Tech, uh, and IHNU. Uh, thank you.